Turn tonight to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll key in on verse 16. And we've been looking at spiritual warfare and the stuff that Satan does that we need to be aware of so that we can counteract it and combat it as we need to with what God's Word tells us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, we read, <clears throat> In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So the flaming arrows, of course, will be the temptations, the stumbling blocks that Satan puts on our path. And with faith, we're able to extinguish those and continue. We need to remember when we're dealing with Satan is Satan is all about destroying relationships. Anything Satan can do to, to, to destroy a relationship, he has a great victory. And it happens in homes. When you see a couple whose relationship deteriorates and fails, you see a home divided, you see children that are hurt for generations, and it, it hurts communities, it hurts families. I knew a man once that he had uh, committed adultery, and they were getting divorced, he and his wife. And when the trial was over, and it was an ugly trial, he said, I didn't realize a so-called act of love could be so hurtful to so many people. And that's Satan's deception. It happens in churches. And you go to churches and you see people parked on opposite sides, sitting on opposite sides, people who won't speak to each other, and get all in a, a tizzy about life. And it happens in communities where you have one faction on one opinion and one faction with another opinion. It happens even in countries. And so Satan wants to divide in relationships. He doesn't want us to be close. When we're close, we're strong. And when you have a man and his wife and they have a strong relationship, there's no separating that. They can stand strong about what's right from God's Word. When you have a house full of those, you have a church that's strong and we stand on God's Word. And so Satan wants to destroy that because Satan knows that to divide is to conquer. And so I want to, look, want to look tonight and explore some ways that Satan tries to defeat us. And all of these have to do with relationships. First of all, Satan tries to defeat us when we have an unforgiving spirit. And this is, I've come to realize, is a very subtle thing. Because we like to think we've forgiven everybody. We've forgiven them in our minds, because we're not upset right now about it. But if we mention their name or what they did, do those emotions all come back? And if they do, they're not coming back. They've been staying there all along. Satan's trying to, to defeat us, distract us from what God is doing in our life and anything he can. And so when we're unforgiving, then we're stirring those emotions instead of letting them go. Satan influences us to choose the selfish route of, I've been hurt by this person. And Satan influences us to choose the carnal path in life. That I've been hurt by this person, so they deserve to be hurt, and I'm, I'll get back at them if I can. Even the score. That's all Satan trying to divide our relationship. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and warned them. He said, we're not ignorant of his intentions. We know what Satan's trying to do. We know he's trying to divide relationships. He know, we know he's trying to cause hurtful feelings. And so let's not go there when we know that's what he's trying to do. And um, in 2 Corinthians 2.10, Paul told them that we need to be careful so that we won't be taken advantage of by Satan. He said, if you forgive anyone, I do too, for what I have forgiven. It is for you in the presence of Christ. I have done this so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan. So every time that we're not forgiving, and especially not forgiving and act on that, we're being taken advantage of by Satan. Uh, that, that's what Paul said. Unforgiveness is one of Satan's most effective schemes because it appeals to the flesh. It appeals to our, our being hurt. It appeals to our pride. And everything about us, unforgiveness fits the bill to the unsaved person or the carnal nature. When we fail to forgive, we're holding on to our anger. We're holding on to our hurt. And then the response is a natural revenge, even though we won't think of it that way. It's just we even the score. They deserve it. All kind of things like that, we think. 
So every time you're unforgiven, your thoughts are on yourself. And just kind of think about it sometime. When you're not forgiving somebody, why are you not forgiving? Is it because they hurt somebody that you don't know? Or they hurt you? And you're not willing to forgive? And that's a selfish thought. Because we're to turn loose of that as Christians. Satan loves to turn your thoughts on yourself. And so he's constantly helping us to think about ourselves and turn our thoughts back to ourselves and about what I want, my needs, my wants, my desires, even what I like. And why can't I have what I like all the time? That's what Satan does. Many have been caught in this trap. And Satan tricks many into thinking they've completely forgiven somebody or they completely love somebody. And then this, the temptation raises its ugly head and catches us again. In the church, this is manifest in ways. I've seen it in a lot of churches. The us for no more situation. I think y'all experienced that also in the past. It's a, a group of folk will be leaders and they'll say, we want it our way. And you don't have to come if you don't want to. But it's going to be our way. And you feel like you're left out. You feel like you're pushed aside. And Satan uses that because then you don't feel like you're a part of the church and you don't feel like you can give like you would have otherwise. And so you're not contributing to the good of the church, the greatness of the church, because you don't feel like you're part of that group because they've, they've had just us forward, no more type attitude. I've seen that in so many churches. And it's nothing new. Forgiving someone is unnatural to a carnal person. But it's supposed to be natural to a Christian. Our new nature is to be forgiven. And also, we cannot expect God to forgive us if we don't forgive others. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 18, not only to forgive, but 70 times 7, we should forgive. That's an unlimited amount of forgiveness. And that's a, that means that every time there's a new reason to forgive, we forgive all over again. Because the relationship is more important. The relationship with one is more important than something being done right. One time we had a, a guest that needed to spend the night and it was uh, the parents of one of Rachel's friends at Delta State, and they were coming to her graduation. She was the first person in their family to graduate college, and they were so proud of her. And so we met them when they knocked at the door, and we opened the door, and there they were, and we met them. We knew they were coming, but we, hadn't, we didn't know them. So the, um, Ann cooked a nice supper, and the lady said, I know how to help load the dishwasher. And you'd think there's, you can't mess that up. She did it horrible. She turned the dishes instead. You know how the slots are? She turned them between those where they're sort of spaced. <laughs> you can't put about five in there. And it was a mess. And Anne put the soap in, closed the door, and washed it. Because the relationship with her was so much more important than the dishwasher being loaded correctly. And it can be redone or whatever. But it didn't have to be done just so. The relationship was more important. And so we need an unlimited amount of forgiveness and acceptance of people where they are. When we stop forgiving, Satan will step in to our life and that will gain foothold to so many other areas of stronghold that he can gain in our life when we first start unforgiveness. So that's number one. Number two, Satan tries to defeat us with anger. Uh, the scripture says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give the devil an opportunity. So the Bible does not say that anger is a sin. But the Bible says anger can become a sin. And the Bible gives us a parameter. Don't be angry more than a day. I think the biblical principles about anger are we're anger in behalf of somebody else. Jesus went in the temple and he was angry. He looked around and saw what was going on. He was angry. Not because it wasn't the way he would set it up. He was angry because people couldn't worship like they were supposed to. And when he turned over the money changers' tables and he drove out the money changers and the, those that were doing uh, marketplace stuff in the temple, the scripture says, and the children could be heard singing. He was more interested. He was angry the children couldn't be heard singing praises to God. He was angry that people were being cheated in their temple tax that they were going to pay or in the sacrifices they were going to bring. 
and he was angry on behalf of the worshipers. And when we're angry about how somebody else is being treated, an injustice in society, how the poor are being overlooked, or how those in need are not being treated right, even prisoners in prison being mistreated. When we're worried about and angry about injustices in society, I think we're bringing, bringing pleasure to God. But we're not supposed to say angry, because if we do, we may do something hostile or postal, and that's not right either. So even though we're angry about situations, we rein in that anger, and we approach it in a systematic and a correct way. The Bible does not permit uh, anger to continue over time. Anger happens suddenly without warning, and we can't help it. It's going to happen. You're going to get angry about yourself, your own needs. You're going to get angry about others. That's going to happen, and there's no way you can control it. And You're going to be angry from time to time because something is not what you were expecting it to be. And it may be a little anger that just as quick as you're angry, you're over it. And it may be a huge anger because it's something huge. But we're to turn loose of it. We can justify it if we want to give Satan a place. Or we can turn loose of it and forgive if we want to be Christian. Any Anytime something happens different than the way we expect it, anger can be a natural result. James 1.20, for man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. We need to decide ahead of time. Are we living to bring righteousness to the world and demonstrate God's righteousness? Or are we living the way we want to? If we're Christian and we're trying to live a godly life, then we'll look at what the Bible says and we'll do what the Bible wants us to do. And the Bible teaches us to live in the righteousness of God. And so when we get angry, we don't accomplish God's righteousness. When we turn loose of that, then we demonstrate God's righteousness. Anger is the opposite of what Jesus told his disciples. We need to die to self. Die to self. And so that we can live for him. In Ephesians 4, all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander, must be removed from you along with all malice. That's a mouthful of stuff, isn't it? Well, anger feeds the root of bitterness and a critical spirit. And anytime you see somebody that's full of bitterness or critical and always criticizing, you know it began with anger somewhere back there. And they hadn't forgiven yet. It's still that anger still seething and still going in their life. And if you think about being angry, if you hold on to it and you don't turn loose, it will result in bitterness and a critical spirit. And I don't want to have that in my life. Anger is often expressed with con condescending remarks, cutting sarcasm or a judgmental attitude in general. You ever know anybody that just, no matter what, they had something critical to say and kind of judgmental. And that's, that's the, the root is anger. Anger does not serve and love others, does not bear wrongs, and does not give of oneself. It gives Satan a stronghold in our life and opens the door to many other carnal traits. It. So and it's wrote, not forgive and forget. That's not in the Bible anywhere. I don't know who made that up, but that's not in the Bible. You forgive and remember. You cannot forget. You forgive by turning loose of trying to get even. And you make up your mind, it's okay. The injustice was wrong. My hurt was real. But I'm not going to try to get even. It's going to be okay. Number three, Satan tries to defeat us with doubt. Have you ever doubted? And, and if you think about major things, probably not. And then again, sometimes yes. Yeah, sometimes our salvation. You doubt your salvation. You wonder, was I really saved? And it's okay, to, it's okay to question that. It's okay. And it's good to question every now and then. Am I saved? And a corollary to am I saved is, am I where I need to be in my discipleship program? Am I growing as a Christian? Sometimes that's the problem, not the salvation. But we have victory with our faith. If we have no faith, we have no victory. We have to believe faith, faith in the Bible, faith in the Word of God. We have to believe in that so that we can have victory. In Genesis 3, Satan attacked Eve with doubt. Did God really say that? Did God really say you would die? And she began to think about it. She wasn't there when God said it. It was something Adam told her. 
And so, did God really say that? Well, Adam may have made a mistake. Maybe Adam messed up. Well, God is love, isn't He? He's all love. And so, surely a God of love wouldn't let something like that happen to me. I guess God didn't say it. And suddenly, now she's vulnerable. And if God didn't say that, then why don't I eat those fruits? It's just that easy. That's how easy, and it's not a long path necessarily that Satan takes to get us into sin. It's that short path, and when he begins with doubt, we're right there. Satan said, God's not going to kill you. So go ahead and eat the fruit. Satan contradicts God's Word. That's why we need to know God's Word. And I don't know if y'all ever heard it before, but you, you need to read your Bible through every year, at least once. You need to think about the words on the page. And let it sink in. And so then when Satan puts those thoughts in your mind, the Scripture's there for the Holy Spirit to bring up to your mind. That's not what God said. Not at all. Satan's constantly leading us to question God's words. The carnal nature wants to justify what we want, our sins. And Satan will give us the words to use. It's just that easy. It's all in the neighborhood of doubt. And we can justify our sinful living. And that's pretty easy to do. We can justify our attitudes or our actions. It doesn't take much. And if we're having a little trouble, Satan will help us out and give us the right words. Satan simply tells us that we won't suffer consequences. That's sometimes that's all it takes because we're Christians. He said, you're not going to suffer the consequences because you're a Christian after all, so it's okay if you do what you have in your mind to do. And then he has us trapped and ready to take the bait and fall for the temptation he has before us. He twists the meaning of the Scriptures. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, we are to bring every thought in obedience to Christ. Uh, chapter 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5, uh, we're to bring every thought in the obedience of Christ. And so that includes every temptation thought that we have. Many times Satan convinces us that we cannot have victory spiritually. And so we settle for defeat. And how many times has it been some God has placed somebody on your mind that they need somebody to witness to them? But we think, no, I can't do a good job. I'll mess it up. Or they're not interested. And then we think, so I won't go. Now Satan convinced us we'll have spiritual defeat, and we gave up just like that. Or how many times has it been nominating committee time and the nominating committee has asked you to serve in one position or another. And you think, no, I can't do that. I'm not good at that. Somebody else is better. You let it go. And so spiritual defeat, just like that. That's, that's all doubt, doubt. Not faith, not trust, not saying, I want to serve my God no matter what it takes or what I need to do. It's doubt that Satan puts in our minds. We miss a lot of opportunities when we let doubt lead us to defeat. And then number four, Satan tries to defeat us with pride. Um, this may be getting a little personal, but our pride. In James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's all we need to do is resist him with the word of God, and he'll flee. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so it's not in our being proud in a sinful way, but in our humility, in a righteous way, that God blesses. Humility is a characteristic that leads us to submit to the Lord. As we submit to the Lord, Satan doesn't want to be a part. When we have pride in this life, we're very, very vulnerable to the things that Satan will say to us. Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. And we never found out in Scripture what that thorn is. That'd be interesting no, to know. Was. But whatever it was, it was a real bad nuisance to Paul. And he prayed three times, or three seasons, that God would remove that thorn in the flesh. But he said God left it there to keep him humble. To remind him that God is God. That he's not. And sometimes things happen in life and we need to just realize, well, God's helping me be humble. It's a reminder that God is God. And we need to always remember that. When you stay aware of your weakness, you can trust the power of Christ to be strong in your life. We humble ourselves 
acknowledging our need for God, and He gives us spiritual victory, and He gets the glory. That's the path. So, we need to avoid pride. It, pride grows when we begin to seek approval from others. Did I do good enough? Was that nice enough? Do you like me? That kind of stuff. So anyway, and also the along the same line with pride is a false pride. And that's, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't do that. And how many times in Scripture did God use somebody who absolutely had no ability to do what they were asked to do? Think about Gideon. He was in a hiding out to try to um, winnow his wheat. He should have been up where the breeze was, but he was hiding out because he was scared to death. And the angel came and said, oh, great warrior. <laughs> that didn't fit. Or Moses, he was a mess. And God said, I want you to lead this great people. Even the apostle Paul. Think about all the great leaders in the Bible. I think Joshua was the only one that kind of rose to the occasion and just continued serving God as he was and did a good job. And just about every other man in the Bible that God used was a man that was either unfit or unable to do what God asked him to do. And they did great things. And they're in the Bible, of all things. So who are we to say, I'm not able? That's a false pride when we take that approach. And then number four, Satan tries to defeat us through unholy living. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily uh, needs to be enumerated in this group, but we need to be careful that sometimes in our righteous living, we're not living right. It's like something can be legally right but morally wrong. And we can justify ourselves and we can look a cut above and we can be faithful to church and pillars in the church and scoundrels in the community or to individuals, not necessarily the community as a whole. In First Peter, he said, Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles or the lost so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they will, by observation, observing your good works, glorify God in the day of visitation. So we need to be careful about Six. the way we live. Amen. Satan tries to defeat us by creating dissension. We kind of covered this to begin with. It's division. The nature of the carnal life is conflict. If you're not saved, it's natural for you to want to have conflict and cause conflict and be a part of conflict. That's natural. But when you're saved you have the nature of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is all about unity. The Trinity is an example of unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together, always working together, never working apart or against each other. Always unity. And that's to spill over into our personal lives. There's to be a unity in our life, not a tension or conflict or turmoil going on. And it's to carry over into our family where there's a unity and into our church, where there's a unity and community and world. And so we are to not be creating dissension as Christians. That's what carnal folk do. There are Christians who seem to live still in the carnal life. And since we all still are dealing with some aspects of sin, we know that carnality can be a part of a saved person's life. We don't like it, but it can be there. And we're always battling it. So we need to be careful about that. When Satan gets us to be self-centered, it's not long before we are disrespectful to others and don't care about them. And it's kind of like it, they, they don't matter. And so we need to be careful that we don't get self-centered in our walk. That creates dissension every time. Because if I come in here and I tell you that the Lord wants us to reach out to our community or to a segment of our community to meet a need. I said, okay, we might do that. But if I came in here and said, all right, I want y'all to do something for me. Come over to my yard tomorrow and help me do some stuff that I want done. How many of y'all would show up? <laughs> and um, not for long when you found out it was all just for me. And see the difference there. What would happen if all of us said, I know I want to do in my yard how many times have you seen somebody out washing their car and somebody will say, when you get through, come wash mine? <laughs> or something similar to that. Or, or said it even. And that's a, so an example of the flesh still there. Instead of saying, 
your car is looking great, you're doing a great job, or even more. You need me to stop and help you? <laughs> and then if they said yes, would you? Get out in your church clothes and good shoes and help them wash their car, or whatever they're doing. First Peter, submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether it's the emperor, the supreme authority, or the governors, as those sent out by him. The scripture teaches us we submit to each other. We reach out to each other. We love each other. Just as we love ourselves. It's not about trying to get from me. It's me trying to do for you. Anything I can do to encourage, help, lift up. And when we have a house full of people trying to reach out, encourage, and lift up, imagine the strength of that church. Because we're each one of us, so like tonight, There'd be 10 people lifting me up. There'd be 10 people lifting you up. Instead of one person promoting myself. <laughs> See the difference? And when I'm promoting myself and 11 of us promoting ourselves, it's all disjointed. But when we're lifting each other up, we're all united. And it's a good thing. The power of God. And Satan is trying to destroy that. That's why he wants to destroy it. Because he doesn't want the church to succeed. So to wind it up, Jesus instructed us to love our enemies. That's tough sometimes. There may be somebody you don't like. You really don't. You just had like, you had never liked that person. Just you don't like them. Can you love them? Can you reach out to them where they're hurting? Can you be there to encourage them? Can you treat them really good? And I found too that sometimes there are people I don't like, and once I start treating them right and getting to know them a little bit. Find out, I really do like them. I just didn't like that first impression. And so we don't know until we really reach out in love. Paul reminded us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to in Romans. And again in Romans, we're to bless those who persecute us. Again in Romans, we're to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Again in Romans, to be at peace with all men, to overcome evil with good. And all of this is a picture of submissiveness, and unity, and all of this brings glory to God.